Good morning and welcome to the first of our proper autumn series of the Japan Society's webinar. I am Bill Emmett and I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. We did, as many of you can attest, hold an exceptional event at short notice on September the 1st to discuss Prime Minister Abe's sudden resignation with Tobias Harris and Keiko Izuka, during which Izuka-san told us that the LDP factions had at that point already spoken in effect and that the new Prime Minister was sure to be Yoshihide Suga. And so, of course, it came to pass with Prime Minister Suga's new cabinet being informally installed in office today albeit with very few changes from the Abe cabinet, beyond the need for a new chief cabinet secretary to replace Mr. Suga, and the elevation of Prime Minister Abe's younger brother, Nobu Kishi, as defense minister. Mr. Suga himself, as the son of a strawberry farmer in Akita Prefecture, may be a newer type of leader, one with a different sort of backstory, as we say, but there is also continuity aplenty in LDP politics, and as this shows, the Abe Kishi dynasty is far from finished. Yet there is a lot more to life than politics, especially during a pandemic, and we are here not to discuss politics, but rather the state of the Japanese and British economies amid that politics, of course, but more crucially amid the pandemic. It is a difficult year in every respect, but let's spare a thought for economists too. It is an especially difficult year in which to interpret economic data, particularly quarterly data, given the impact of the timing of COVID related restrictions, travel bans and the like on that data. So we've seen a lot of dramatic numbers of 20% plus declines in GDP or sudden dramatic rebounds, but they are not very meaningful because so much depends on tiny differences in timing. For what it's worth, which may not be much, today the OECD in Paris released a new interim economic outlook, which offered forecasts that were slightly more optimistic than ones it published in June for 2020 and 2021. The OECD's forecast is now for a 5.8% decline in Japan's GDP in 2020, compared with a 6% decline in June. Its forecast for the UK is for a 10.1% decline in GDP in 2020, compared with an 11.5% forecast in June. So an improvement in both cases, although modestly. Both countries do resume growth in 2021 on these forecasts. Japan rather weakly by 1.5% in 2021. Britain quite strongly by 7.6%, albeit a bit more weakly than was expected by the OECD in June. But all of these forecasts are, of course, based on a very, very difficult set of assumptions and, and a very unusual circumstance. And indeed, the difference for 2020 between Japan and the UK may reflect differences in the severity of the coronavirus outbreak and the restrictions that were acquired in both our countries, but mainly they will reflect the fact that the British economy is far more exposed to world demand and world trade than is the Japanese economy. So where might we be heading now in the eighth or so month of the pandemic, depending on your chosen starting point? what might prove the biggest factors domestically and externally in determining our medium term economic prospects in both our countries. To address those questions, I'm welcoming two experts who will be very familiar to Japan Society members and indeed anyone who has monitored economic thinking in both our countries in recent decades. In Britain, I welcome Gerard Lyons, who has kindly addressed the Japan Society on numerous occasions, especially when he was chief economist at Daiichi Kangyo Bank's international operation, and then at Standard Chartered Bank, and latterly as chief economic advisor to the mayor of London, a certain Boris Johnson, of whom you may have heard. Gerard now holds a variety of roles, including as a board member of the Bank of China and as an economic advisor to many institutions. In Japan, in Tokyo, I welcome Noriko Hama, who became well known to many of us during the 1990s as chief representative in London of Mitsubishi Research Institute, and then as general manager of MRI's economic research department in Tokyo. She is now a professor at Doshisha Business School in Kyoto, as well as a much cited economic commentator and author, especially on the impact of non-regular precarious work 
in the labor market on the economy and society. In fact, she published a new book only last week. The translation of the Japanese title is The Economics of Living Together. As usual, each speaker will open with 10 minutes of remarks, after which we will have a discussion with, most importantly, your questions. Please submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can vote for other people's questions to promote them. In celebration of her new book, as well as the arrival of a new government, it feels right to ask Noriko Hama to open our webinar. So over to you, Noriko. Okay, Bill, thank you very much indeed for having me. And I must say, I was delighted to find the names of my very good friends in your list of participants. So that's very exciting for me too. And thank you for that as well. Um, okay, so we now have a new prime minister. Um, and how is he going to deal with the very many difficulties that the Japanese economy has? Uh, perhaps I should begin by saying uh, that I took to calling Abenomics, Ahonomics, Aho uh, meaning stupid, silly, bonkers in the Japanese language. Uh, but now I think that we have Mr. Suga as the prime minister. I think I will call his economic policy Suka. Nomics, not suga, but ska nomics. Uh, ska meaning empty, blank, useless. Um, that said, however, I think that, that there is probably more to Mr. Suga's uh, policy, uh, economic policy management than just uh, blankness. I think there's a certain sinister element there. I especially, well, I mean, I think he he is basically trying to run the economy on the principle of heaven helps those who help themselves. Uh, he says that his priorities are such that he will uh, 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 stress that we should self-help. First comes self-help and then help from families and policy help last, which essentially seems to indicate that he has no time for losers um, that he, he is only interested in people who are able to fend for themselves. Now that, I think, is the worst possible line of thinking uh, that we can have from, from policymakers at this time. Uh, because uh, the fundamental problem with the Japanese economy at this time, I think, is very much uh, uh, the issue of uh, poverty in affluence. We are a very rich economy. Uh, there is uh, all this uh, 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 wealth uh, 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 surrounding us. And yet in the midst of that affluence, we have uh, very cold spots of poverty. Uh, our relative poverty, uh, policy, poverty rather, poverty ratio um, sort of hangs around about 15 to 16% of the population. Uh, which is ridiculous for a nation as uh, uh, wealthy as this. Um, and I think the more uh, 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 the nations with the lowest poverty ratios, such as Denmark um, and Iceland, they have poverty ratios around four to five, four, four to five percent. Uh, and Japan's uh, 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 figures are almost three times that level, which does not make sense at all. And especially under these COVID-19 uh, uh, conditions, uh, that situation is clearly getting worse. So we, what we need now is economics of, of compassion, as opposed to the economics of helping all, only those that can help themselves. So I think it is a very um, sad and serious situation we have at this point in time. At this very point in time when we need the economics of compassion, uh, we have this person uh, who is uh, uh, emphasizing self-help. So that's something we need to watch out for very carefully. And at this time, I think I should mention that uh, Mr. Suga is actually a great uh, admirer of Niccolo Machiavelli. And he has actually written in one of his books uh, that he, uh, he will go forth with Machiavelli's words in his heart. So that's quite a thing to say. Uh, as we all know, uh, Machiavelli has said some very unpleasant things and rather frightening things. Um, I think at one time that he said that if one is building a nation and um, putting together its laws, one has to assume uh, that men, all men are wicked 
and that left to their own devices, they will uh, uh, do as their evil hearts dictate to them. So that's a very, very sinister remark. Indeed, to carry in your heart as you go around your or po policy and political business. So that's something that we need to keep in mind about this person. Um, McAvery also said that a prince has to be a fox uh, in order to avoid traps and to be a lion in order to frighten off the wolves. Um, well, Mr. Suga certainly doesn't look like a lion, uh, but he certainly has a very foxy feel to him. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, he seems to have the cunning of a fox and uh, the slipperiness of an eel, and the way he has responded to uh, media questioning and so forth. So I think it's very un unfortunate uh, for Japan to be confronting uh, this political situation at this time. Uh, the economy, the figures you cited, Bill, of 5.8% negative growth this year, I think looks to me pretty optim optimistic. Uh, although we did not have the severe um, a, 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 and formal lockdowns that you had in Europe, in Japan. Um, I think people were, became very, very frightened, very cautious, very nervous about the outlook. Uh, so for all the encouragement that, strangely enough, the government is now putting forth saying, you go and travel, uh, people are very cautious about moving about. So I think that uh, we will have much, a much harsher negative figure than the OECD seems to assume. Um, so uh, the, the difficulties continue. Um, and I think the, uh, the inequalities that have certainly become more severe, uh, given the COVID situation, I think is one really single most serious issue um, that policy needs to deal with. But again, as I say, the economics of self-help is uh, not a thing that is very helpful at this time. Um, I, and I think there has been, been very little concern, very little care about where people are hurting, in what way. Uh, there was uh, very little care for sorting out the individual problems that people and small businesses were facing as we uh, went into COVID and we lived through them. It's all been th being about throwing money, large amounts of money uh, at problems in a very, very uh, uh, um, undifferentiated undifferentiated ways, if you'd like to put it that way. Um, I think not enough concern has been put uh, towards uh, people who are who were in really great difficulties. It's, it's all been about um, how policy can gain points, how policy can manage not to lose points uh, when ahonomics was in that action. I think that the SUGA approach is pretty, is, is going to be much, very much the same. Um, and if so, if anything, I think a, a lot more worse, uh, if such a thing is possible, rather than economics, uh, because in a sense, Mr. Abe was a very easy person to, to read, and uh, uh, we knew what he was about, the kind of uh, conspiracies that he was trying to get to were very, very, very transparent indeed. Uh, but uh, uh, as an admirer of McEvely, of course, uh, Mr. Suga, uh, comes as, across as a much more uh, manipulative, um, conspiratorial person. So um, that indicates that he will hide his ambitions, he will hide his intentions much more cleverly than Mr. Abe did. Um, so we need to be very watchful, point, uh, uh, pinpointing where uh, his ambitions lie and where he intends to take us. Um, so I was, uh, when Abe um, announced his resignation, I, I got a bit of a shock. I thought that I, that I was going to lose my attack target and uh, become ill or something. Uh, but now I know that I have to live to fight another day uh, with this even more sinister person and uh, I'll try to prevent him from making a total mess of this economy, which is, in, which is already in severe difficulties. So I think that I've, that's just about time for me to shut up for the moment, I think. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Noriko, for a typically clear and trenchant uh, set of views. I think, um, I hope Mr. Suga um, will, uh, will uh, receive your blows um, um, on a regular basis by the sound of it. Um, it's particularly interesting to think of um, 
the parallel with um, with the prince with Machiavelli and how he, what how, what would happen if the uh, if the consigliere if the advisor becomes the prince uh, and that's really what you're analyzing. I also agree very quickly about the inequality issue, um, as I said in a letter to the FT actually uh, the last week or the week before. Um, I think that basically Abenomics has been a cheap labor strategy um, in a country that should be aspiring to be the Switzerland of Asia. Um, and, a, and a high wage. So I, I absolutely with you there about the cheap labor issue. Now, Britain, Gerard, Lance, I mean, I'm sure it's tempting for you to talk about Asia, given your expertise, but let's have you first talking about the UK and how yes. you see it for us. Well, first and foremost, it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to speak to the Japan Society and to join both yourself, Bill, and Noriko. It's great indeed to reconnect with Noriko. Um, let me focus my comments on three areas. First, the UK economy and COVID. Second, Brexit, because it wouldn't be right to talk about the UK without mentioning Brexit early in the discussion. And third, the UK and the global picture. Um, first, the current situation in the UK. Uh, the UK economy entered this year in a very fragile state. 2019 was not a particularly good year for the UK economy, largely because of the political crisis. As we entered this year, uh, there was hope for the government to unveil an economic vision. Uh, but the two issues that were dominating conversation at the beginning of this year were Brexit and also levelling up, given that levelling up had come to the fore in the election. As we've moved through the year, first COVID, more recently Brexit, and most likely in the coming months, unemployment, as unemployment starts to rise, have sort of taken all the oxygen and energy out of government policy focusing on those areas, first COVID, now at the moment, Brexit, and in coming months, unemployment. But echoing what Narika was saying about Japan, the UK is a very imbalanced economy. Um, it's almost like a barbell in the gym where the weights are at one end of the bar and at the other end of the bar. Some parts of the UK are world-class, first rate, financial services, parts of our industrial sector, and indeed many other parts of the economy. But unfortunately, the other end is also very important because the UK is a low growth, low wage, low productivity economy. So in my view, the most important thing for this government has been to have a pro-growth agenda. It hasn't come to the fore yet. But as we emerge from this crisis, I hope it will come to the fore. The imbalances in the UK are evident in many respects. Place is one of them. Um, the e European Commission does a survey every three years of the most competitive regions of Europe. Three of the top five, and I think there's 267 sub-regions, three of the top five are in the southeast of England. Remarkable. But the UK has some of the underperforming regions of Europe as well. So place is one aspect, but there's many other components of that levelling up agenda. But the COVID crisis really hit us hard. We had a deep recession, particularly focused in March and April, but the economy has started to turn around. But it's almost like a two-speed recovery. One part of the economy is recovering pretty strongly. We've seen the rebound in, Mar in May, June, July, and into August. And retail sector is above where it was at the beginning of this year. And there's a lot of pent-up savings. However, because of the vaccine gap, necessary social distancing, large swathes of the economy are not able to return to normal. And indeed, the creative sector, for instance, which is about 5.8% of the economy, is undoubtedly going to be hit hard, as are other parts, tourism, food, accommodation sector. So even though the economy is recovering, and many people are trying desperately to depict what letter it will be, whether it's a V, a U, or whatever, the reality is that while some parts will rebound strongly and quickly, it will probably not be until the end of next year at the earliest, or more likely the beginning of 2022, that will we be able to return to pre-crisis levels. In that environment, policy has to remain accommodative. And the big debate in coming months will be on the policy agenda, monetary and fiscal policy. Monetary policy has been accommodative. It needs to remain accommodative with quantitative easing and interest rates remaining low for some time. We can talk about this further in the Q&A. The big question is what's going to happen on fiscal policy. I think one should not panic. Debt to GDP is now over 100%. It's not a great situation, but it's better than the alternative would have been. 
After the Second World War, debt to GDP was about 250 to 260%. The important thing is to bring debt down as a proportion of GDP steadily over time. It requires consistency between monetary and fiscal policy. Financial repression is the phrase often used, interest rates remaining low. But it requires the government not to panic by raising taxes. It does require the government to keep control of public spending, but not to have austerity in terms of cutting public spending just yet. One needs to see the economy grow and ideally avoid some of the problems we had in the wake of the global financial crisis. Finally, on the current situation, often it's said that the UK has done very poorly as a result of COVID. Certainly the death figure is not particularly good, but I think it's important to stress that the UK is in that same bunch of countries in Western Europe as one or two others, namely Spain, Italy, France, Belgium, as well as the UK. Um, the current situation is one where I think people are maybe too fearful. You could argue for obvious reasons. I think we need to avoid a second lockdown and I think the fact that the death rates are low, hospital admissions are low, all of these factors suggest that we could be slightly more relaxed than we currently are. But there's no doubt that just as the lockdown did hit the economy hard, it will take some time to return to business as usual. Second part is focusing very much on Brexit. Look, there's lots to say about Brexit, but I think two key issues come to the fore. One is that in the wake of the 2016 referendum, we didn't act quickly enough to start to outline our post-Brexit strategy and vision. And therefore, there is still some confusion, particularly the further one travels, it seems to me, from the UK. The danger, of course, at the moment is that too many media outlets in the UK have unfortunately allowed their editorial views to dominate their coverage of the Brexit issue. So, you can have lots of echo chambers around the UK and indeed globally when one looks at this issue. But the politics is important. Um, if one looks at the 12 regions of the UK, three voted to remain, Northern Ireland, Scotland and London. Nine voted to leave, Wales and the eight regions of England outside of London. And that latter issue was particularly important in last December's general election and indeed is still important in the opinion polls in terms of people's views towards Brexit. It does suggest political tensions and issues with respect to the devolved regions will remain. On the economic side, to make a success of Brexit, one needs to get three things right. Our relationship with the European Union, our domestic agenda, and our position with the rest of the world. All are important. What we've seen as we've moved through this year in the sort of Oh, how could one describe the negotiations? Let's just take a deep sigh. But the negotiations have shown that the government is determined for our relationship with the EU not to tie our hands on our domestic policy or on our position with the rest of the world. Hence the focus on being outside the single market and outside the customs union. The deal with Japan signed last week is very encouraging, but one should stress that one needs to have a deal with the EU to allow that deal with Japan really to kick into place. The final point to say about Brexit, I think, is events in the last week. And um, clearly, it's not right in my mind for any country to break an international treaty. Um, I think Brandon Lewis, the government minister, was right to say what he did to, in the House of Commons. One naturally has to tell the truth when one speaks in that chamber or indeed anywhere. And if the UK felt it was breaking the treaty, it clearly had to say so. Although we've seen a lot of some nuanced comments since suggesting that the EU too might be breaking the treaty. Whether this is all a negotiating strategy or not remains to be seen. But I think it's important that in the deal, doing the deal with the EU, one also positions the UK well globally. And I think the next few weeks will suggest that politics will come more and more to the fore. And I think it makes sense to expect a deal to be agreed before the end of the year, although it's not inevitable now in the light of the most recent developments. Third and finally, the global picture in the UK. Everyone sort of is talking about what will change as a result of this crisis, but also I think it's very important to stress that some things will not change. The things that will not change are things that were evident before the crisis and have been very noticeable as we've moved through, I would say, recent months. First is that we now have unconventional policy, not just in the UK, but globally. Unconventional monetary policy and unconventional fiscal policy with public debt levels at a global high. That raises all sorts of questions. 
The fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, and the whole drive of the data and digital revolution was very evident before the crisis. If anything, it's become more evident as we move through the crisis. And I would say the growth of the Indo-Pacific region from India in the West to America in the East, including naturally China and Japan, is the dominant growth region of the world. And Britain, like the rest of Western Europe, needs to really ask itself how it positions itself in this changing grow global growth dynamic. But the three things, finally, that I think that will change as a result of this crisis are what I call the three Gs, grassroots, green, and geopolitics. Grassroots is not a reverse of globalization, but a greater focus on things being done locally, if possible. Green, the green agenda, already important, has been given a greater lease of life. The UK is aiming, as we know, for carbon neutral by 2050. And the last G, I think, is particularly important given the politics in Japan, as well as one could say globally, the geopolitical tensions, the emergence of the G2, and how we all position ourselves. It clearly matters in terms of the US-UK relationship post this election, and naturally it matters in terms of the Japan relationship with everyone post their new prime minister. So let me leave it there, those three areas, the UK, COVID, we are recovering but it will take some time to get back to pre-crisis levels. UK and Brexit, still some work to be done and the global agenda. Some things will change and some things that were evident before the crisis will continue to be dominant after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. That was all very, very clear and comprehensive. I'm particularly glad from the specific point of view of the Japan Society, you emphasized uh, the status of the EU, this is the UK-Japan trade deal, which is a very important uh, to stress that while it's agreed in principle, it can't go ahead until we have a, a relationship with the EU within which it can be rooted. And I think that's a very Im Im important point for the future. And I'm glad of your sense of optimism that, the, that, um, the, that on balance, at least, the politics will produce an outcome. Um, we could argue about the outcome, but uh, that, will, that there will be an outcome will surely be an important one, important fact. Um, now, some questions are coming through, and I'm just going to start with them, but then move, because uh, there, there are several on Japan, which I'm then going to um, move through to, uh, to the UK. But uh, that, uh, with Noriko on screen, I'm going to um, just um, move quickly to the questions before I bring, come back to my own issues. But uh, Yuichiro Nakajima, um, investment banker in London, you may well know him, Noriko, I'm sure. He has um, um, riffed on your scanomics point. Um, and he says, scanomics has ec echoes of scatology as well, as he says. The most, the most Machiavellian person in the cabinet, he thinks, is Taro Asso, who retains control of the Ministry of Finance. And he wants to know, what are your views, Hamasan, of Asso-san's influence on policymaking in the areas of fiscal monetary taxation policy? Um, is that important? And he adds a further question, which is a political one. Do you think that Suga will survive beyond September 2021? Um, is this, or is this, should we just be thinking about this as a one year um, uh, reign? Okay, thank you very much, Yuichiro. Yes, um, it's certainly wonderful to be talking to you. Um, Mr. Asso, I doubt whether he has the ability to uh, uh, read Machiavelli, let alone understand him, um, but, and, and about his influence in this cabinet. Um, I don't know. I think uh, um, he seems to be getting pretty tired of politics altogether. He looks very bored in uh, 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 parliamentary uh, uh, sessions and so forth. So I rather think that he may he, uh, 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 he will keep a relatively low profile. Um, certainly in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. I mean, he may uh, like to step in with his poor or sense of judgment uh, with terrible uh, jokes and that kind of thing. But I don't really think that he will come to the helm um, and in, in making policy and in administering policy. I think he will very much uh, 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 stand in a if you like, a background position, uh, waiting to jump in if he, if he can gain points. Um, and as for, sorry, what was the second question? Second question was essentially, should we see the Suga um, cabinet as being um, a one-year show? 
Right, right. Whether he will last, and uh, 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 whether he will in, in, in indeed last a, a win a general election, um, I think that's very much um, something that at least Suga is aiming for. Uh, he seems quite determined uh, to remain in 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 power uh, for for a, a durable period of time. He does not uh, uh, see himself as a caretaker prime minister. That I think he has made very clear. Uh, so I think he will try very very hard to make an impression uh, of uh, uh, being seen to be doing something. Um, and uh, really very much, again, try to gain as many points as possible. And being the kind of manipulative person that he is, he may actually succeed in doing that. We, we have to watch out very carefully about, he, uh, about the way in which he puts his act together. So he may actually quite surprise um, on the, well, downside side, insofar as we are concerned. But um, yes, that's something to be very watching very carefully for. So Gerard, let me ask you your, your views on Japan. I mean, you uh, were particularly good at, uh, at judging if, like the, the, the lost decade and the impact of the, of the financial crisis um, in the 90s and 2000s. Now we've had a very accommodative monetary policy under Abenomics, but mm -hmm. there is, has been a difficulty in getting uh, wages to rise and to and a continuous weakness of demand, even if it's been more stable in recent years. What, what's your take on, on um, the, yeah. the Abe inheritance? And yeah, um, I, was, I would probably be more positive about Abe than Noriko. If I look at the labor market situation in Japan, that has been a positive in the last few years in terms of total employment, more women in work, and that is a welcome development. Um, the Japanese situation also highlights how unconventional monetary and fiscal policy can be pushed. And I think that has lessons for Western economies. But I think if one thinks of it, the three arrows of Abe almost could mirror what the three arrows of Boris Johnson should be. One is monetary policy and financial stability and the important role that the central bank plays. Central bank effectively is not as independent as many people would let you believe. And that's true in more and more countries now. Uh, fiscal policy, um, very unconventional and how one actually addresses that whole debt picture. But the third arrow has been particularly important, the whole supply side agenda. But I agree with you, it's very difficult to get that strong rate of growth. My issue about Abe that's interest, that will be very different to in terms of how Suga might uh, emerge, is Abe on the international scene. Not only did he seem to travel a lot, he always tried to make an impact when he did travel. And Japan's economic policy has been very associated with him. Whether Suga will have that impact in terms of the relationship with China and the relationship with the States, I think will be particularly important for the rest of us. And how that old quad that really didn't take off in the Australia, Japan, and the US, whether there's anything to it in the future. Thank you. Let me, let me ask, um, uh, and I absolutely agree, he had a much greater impact internationally, I mean, both in foreign affairs and in uh, economics. And one of the virtues of having the same prime minister for seven years, that you can really yeah. build up relationships and, uh, and so forth in a way that you can't when you're a one or two year um, uh, uh, cabinet. Let me ask both of you about one of the underlying trends that Gerard uh, mentioned, namely the, it, the technological revolution, the AI and all the effects it's having, um, and ask both of you how you see that playing through, because um, the paradox of this situation of today and of recent years has been fantastic technological change, but slow productivity growth in both our countries, including Japan, where you've had essentially a labor shortage, um, despite the rise in, in uh, labor force participation of both the elderly and of, of women. Um, why isn't, or what can happen to, to boost productivity? And why is, um, why is the technology not coming through into the productivity statistics? Maybe start with you, Noriko, on that, and then back to Gerard, since he raised it. Okay, well, um, first of all, I should like to say that I'm very skeptical about uh, the whole discussion of productivity. Uh, productivity growth has been presented as something really spotlessly wonderful. 
uh, that will lead to wage increases, that will be lead to a better and happier economic life for all concerned. But companies, after all, um, seek productivity growth because they want to cut costs and they are looking for greater efficiency. Um, so that, uh, as, so that uh, it does not always uh, follow that higher productivity growth will lead to higher wages and a better uh, 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 economic situation for the working people. So I think there's been much, much too much stress being put on productivity as the uh, 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 wonderful answer to everything. Um, so I'm rather skeptical on that point. Um, uh, 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 but, uh, and that said, why the low productivity in spite of all the wonderful technologies? Well, I think that, uh, I think that actually it, it, it's a psychological thing on the part of the people. People are frightened to um, thrust out, if you will, uh, embrace new technologies. I think the caution and the, um, uh, what I would put as the, uh, 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 well, the economics of fear on the part of the people, which makes it uh, very difficult for new um, developments to take, 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 take off. Uh, the remote economy has certainly come to Japan in a big way, uh, but I, I think it is very, very localized. It has not spread uh, uh, wide in the field. So there are spots. I think this is related to the uh, poverty and affluence issue. There, there are people, there are companies who simply cannot have access to all of the things that lead to greater pro productivity growth. Uh, they are shut out of that brave new world, if you will. And that's something that needs to be um, uh, uh, addressed. And Gerald talked about the regional disparity in economic performance in the UK. Um, in the Japanese case, it's not so much regional disparity as people disparity, uh, people who are unable to access that uh, 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 new world. So I think we need to be very uh, watchful of uh, this situation. No, thank you. I think, I mean, uh, right, there is an issue of the division between labor and capital of the fruits of productivity growth. That's clearly a, a fundamental point, but also this issue of the gap between the most productive sectors, companies, regions, and, and others. Gerard, on, uh, what's your thinking? Yeah, um, two, two different aspects to your question. One, the artificial intelligence fourth industrial revolution will have a profound impact on the labor market. And this was a big focus of attention in terms of how it would impact the world of work even before coronavirus. I think all of this now comes together. What we know from previous industrial revolutions, whether you think we've had three or four before, whatever number, um, it's almost three aspects have come to the fore. There's a substitution effect that's negative for the world of work. There's an income effect that's positive as goods become cheaper. And then there's a whole new set of jobs that are created. So net net, um, previous industrial revolutions have been positive for the world of work, but they've had a big dislocation. The fact that this is happening at a time of a dislocation post-COVID makes it very difficult and probably implies that government intervention will continue to be evident in labour markets across the world, particularly here in the UK, in a way in which people weren't expecting maybe even last year, never mind now. Um, in terms of productivity, I think the issues have been touched on in terms of you mentioned there the ability to spread the gains of success from high productive sectors to low productive sectors. And Narika touched on the accessibility. Here in the UK, we often focus on the skills and training as always the issue. It's a longer term development. It's like apple pie and mother motherhood. Everyone says positive things about them. Skills and training, everyone says positive things and it parks the problem for the future. I do think we need to have a pro-growth agenda to try and raise the trend rate of growth and see how that maps out. And linked into this, I would say it has to be a focus on all the eyes, on innovation. Here in the UK, we don't get the, all the good ideas to fruition. Um, it needs to be infrastructure spending. Now, Japan has shown that sometimes you can have too much of a good thing when it comes to infrastructure. But here we have an infrastructure gap, I would say, in the UK. Um, it's also about investment, the right type of investment. We don't necessarily measure investment in the right way in the UK, but we need to see more investment. 
And the last thing is the whole incentive structure, uh, regulations and tax, is about removing the barriers to entry of new players. Um, here, what I find remarkable to conclude in Western Europe, if one looks at the big companies, they rarely seem to change in a way in which they do change in America. There's more dynamism. And I think we have too much protection of the incumbent. I'm not suggesting disruption should always be pushed for and pursued, but it's part and parcel of addressing this productivity issue, as well as the overall need for stronger demand. And just as a, a quick follow on on that before I shift to some more questions, do you, do you think that, um, I mean, as part of the background to all of this, um, the, the, the politics of the Brexit deal, there's been a lot of talk about, as it were, the right to subsidize startups. I mean, as it were, the sense that there's a pick, pick, picking of winners strategy there. I mean, yeah. uh, leaving aside the political interpretation, do you think that that is, needs to be part of, in your view, should that be part of British strategy? Right. There's two different parts to this. First is that I think it's important that we don't bind ourselves with EU rules and regulations in which we have no vote, no voice, no veto. So I would say that's the most important aspect of this debate. Mm -hmm. It's gone one level down to the ability to subsidise. Yes, you should have the ability to subsidise if your government or your, if your electorate wants it, but that should not be the route that you always expect as the default. But I remember writing about this in Clean Brexit with Liam Halligan. Um, I think it was Dale LSE was highlighting how the US has been quite successful in picking those technology high growth sectors. But the idea that you can pick winners has, well, Japan shows that sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I don't believe that regulators and bureaucrats will be any better than anyone else. Sometimes they might get it right. So, so in answer to your question, I don't think it should be a central aspect of policy. I don't think it should be the dominant theme that overrides everything else. But it's one of those many different things that you want to have there if you need to use it. Thank you. Now, so I've got a few questions about China and relations with China coming through. Um, Duncan Bartlett asking about um, how you see Noriko relations between South Korea, China and Japan developing under Prime Minister Suga. And we also have um, Paul Diamond asking about Suga's personal engagement with China. We might go on from that to ask to after you think about the, how important relations with China are um, economically and politically. Noriko, I might, I'll, I'll go over to Gerard and about the centrality of relations with China and the G2. Noriko. Okay, well, uh, Japan's relationship both with both China and South Korea are about as bad as they can be at this uh, precise moment. Uh, the political tensions are very great. Uh, now, whether Mr. Suga can uh, 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 correct this situation, well, this is a huge question mark because he has hardly ever opened his mouth about uh, either China or South Korea in a meaningful way. Um, he has deliberately kept silent on these points and let Abe speak uh, 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 all, all he wants. So uh, on the evidence, uh, I have to say, we don't know. Uh, but be, if you think of him as the, the uh, Machiavelli of Japanese politics, I'm sure he will think about, uh, uh, he will think uh, realistically um, and uh, pragmatically about what he can gain uh, from uh, 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 improving relationships with both those countries, uh, what he can gain by maintaining the tensions. He will weigh these things, I think, in his uh, 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 conspiratorial way, if you like, and uh, come up with answers which do, which probably don't look very consistent to us, but makes sense to him. Um, and overall, I don't think that uh, he will handle these relationships um, in a way uh, that is good for the Japanese people. Uh, we need to, 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 to have a good relationship, a working relationship, a sensible relationship, uh, both with China and South Korea. Uh, but I don't think that is the way his mind will go. Uh, he, he will calculate whether it is good for him politically uh, to go uh, in the way of improvement and to go in, in the way of more confrontation. So I think it's going to be a very confusing development altogether from the point of view 
of the, of the Japanese people, which again, I think is a very unfortunate thing for us altogether. Now, Gerard, I mean, for Japan, obviously, uh, China is a much more imp- not is a, is a very significant trading partner as a as a, you know, the biggest single trading partner as a neighbor. Um, uh, much less important for Britain. I mean, as a further a f- more distant trader. But how do you see the the China issue in in economic policy terms? I mean, Huawei, U.S. China trade war, and all of the related issues that have yeah, um, obviously very important. I found it interesting reading about Sh- Mr. Suga last week that one of the things was that he apparently uh, styled himself on Hideyoshi, the warlord man from the 1500s who I think invaded China and Korea. Hopefully that doesn't augur or suggest anything for the future. I think it's important, whether it's Japan or the UK, that you get on well with your neighbors, obviously. But in terms of the China issue, look, the China, China's economic and political rise has been remarkable. Um, China is now the second biggest economy, uh, but I, from a UK perspective, and I've written about this recently because the issue has become more important here in the UK in the white weight of the whole uh, technology saga. I think the UK politicians need to, in my mind, outline the strategic and non-strategic areas so that businesses and finance and banks can see where the political red lines are. That strategic relationship still needs to be a sensible one but defense, security, intelligence are those issues within that. But the non-strategic areas then are areas where business can naturally involve themselves with not just China, but other countries across the globe. I think we have to be grown up about this. China's rise has been peaceful. China's influence is very much more regional within Asia. But clearly the Belt Road Initiative sees China expanding further globally. And the UK itself can position itself to work with China in terms of the Belt Road. But of course, human rights, the rule of law, these are vital issues. It can't just be a relationship based solely on economics. But I think China and the US naturally are the two dominant economies. And I think more and more of the focus will be on the G2. In the wake of the global financial crisis, we move from a G7 to a G20. I tend to think it's more back to a G2. Maybe to conclude, I think even though the question was about China, the US election this year will be particularly important. And it has it reminds me of 1972 and 1992 in some respects, 72 when Nixon tied up himself, built up the relationship with China. That had a profound impact for Western Europe, which wasn't expecting that. And after the, in the early 90s, the fall of the Soviet Union and how the Americans then pivoted themselves. So Western Europe clearly is an important part of this equation and how the UK positions itself globally as well as with the rest of the Western Europe is vitally important as well within this. Thank you. Now, um, we've got some questions. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go specifically to a question about travel and tourism that Martin Barrow has put in. Um, clearly, this is very important for both our economies. At the moment, um, international tourism essentially... Um, or, Absolutely, absolutely zero or more or less zero in Japan, but um, a bit above zero in the UK, but not very high. Um, um, Martin says he would welcome inputs on how recovery and travel and tourism in both countries can occur. And is there uh, the potential for teamwork and collaboration between the both? Um, how quickly do you think international tourism will recover? And what will what is the economic salience of it? Um, Noriko, what, how do you, I mean, this is also relates to the China question um, to some degree, since many of the tourists are Chinese. Um, when is this going to come back and how important does it become for the Japanese economy? Well, when, it, when is it going to come back? Uh, not anytime soon is the clear answer. Yes, uh, very many of our inbound uh, travelers were Chinese, uh, that sort of t- more or less totally dried up at this point in time. And I don't see how that can really come, come up in any, come back in any meaningful way. Uh, Japanese, the Japanese people are not traveling outside of Japan. Well, they're not traveling within Japan either, being very, very, keeping themselves uh, to themselves very still. So I don't really think the revival 
um, is going to happen um, in a meaning, any meaningful way anytime soon. And of course, this is devastating the uh, tourism industry. I mean, it's amazing to think that we were talking about over tourism uh, uh, until the COVID situation hit us. Uh, now uh, we have no tourism whatsoever. But I suppose in a sense that um, this is a time when we ought to sit back and think about um, how tourism should conduct itself in uh, this, in our world, in our civilized world, without uh, creating this over tourism situation. Gerard was talking about green as an important aspect of how we should, uh, or, or of our, uh, how we should focus our attention um, in this in these circumstances. I think with given the over tourism was really destroying the green element of planet Earth, if you like. Uh, so a little bit of a slowdown uh, might be something that if we can get it under control, a little bit of a slowdown might actually be uh, the start of something new. Uh, we ought, I think, to be thinking along those lines as well as thinking about how we should revive the whole um, uh, sort of bullet speed traveling that everybody was going in for. So, Gerard, what's your thought on this? I mean, I'll put in my, my prejudice. I'm much keener on coal-fired power, power plants being abolished than me bring, me not traveling as much. But um, <laughs> that's my selfish global, global jet-setter um, point of view. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think there are pull and push factors in this. Um, the push factor, the fact that will make people want to travel, is how they individually feel about the virus and their own safety. Um, so there's a global response to that. Um, maybe, maybe we're past the worst of this epidemic already, but I think it's only when we have a vaccine that people might generally feel that they can start to travel. But what we can do in the UK or indeed any country is more on the pool side, make themselves both safe and attractive to visit and also remove rules and regulations that inhibit as part of rules and regulations, make people feel that it is safe in terms of whatever needs to be done. I think this virus has been very interesting on the whole crisis in many different respects. Key workers has been a key phrase in the UK. Um, people valuing people they might not have valued before, but they should have done. But also in terms of sectors, if one visits central London, I was in London yesterday, and even though the suburbs of London are buzzing, the center of London is still very quiet and it's like a ghost town. And what one has seen is the importance of the whole ecosystem, which is not only tourism, but the whole creative sector in London. And one could argue that across many parts of the UK. So it's not only about the economy, it's the whole wider ecosystem linked into that. And the creative sector, I think, is the important part of this, as is tourism. So I think we need to make sure we recognize the importance of that. And what it means in the very near term is that even though state aid is not where we should be going longer term, it might be necessary to help certain sectors of the economy who through no fault of their own are facing this difficult phase where their business model, while it will work when there's a vaccine, will not be able to work now. So it poses further policy issues, but coming back to Martin's question, yes, it's important, the tourism and the whole creative sector. And to both of you, I mean, there's a question about the Olympics. Um, let's have an assumption that there's a there's a vaccine available in January, um, just for this just for the sake of argument. Depends on the quantity and so forth. But do you think Noriko first and Gerard? Do you think that then means the Olympics will go ahead? And does it matter economically whether it does or it doesn't? Very much now, since most of the inf since the infrastructure is is built, the big the big costs have been have been spent already. Well, okay. Um, I'm uh, I'm sympathetic to the athletes, but I hope the the answer to your question: Will the Olympics go ahead? Is I hope not. Um, I had never really believed that Tokyo should host this kind of thing. It was totally unnecessary. Uh, it was totally the ambition of the politicians um, concerned that uh, 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 led to this thing happening in Japan. I don't think this is anything that we need at this moment. Uh, what we need in Japan is not further growth, not further exciting uh, events, uh, but a proper redistrib redistribution policy to deal with the uh, disparity issue. Um, and uh, all this hype around the Olympics was not really helping at all. 
Um, and uh, so big events are not things that we need in Japan at this moment. So hopefully they will not go ahead. Uh, but the outlook, I think, is very finely balanced indeed. However, I mean, realistically uh, 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 thinking, I don't really see how they can go ahead. Even the athletes who are looking forward to them must surely be frightened about uh, the negative outcomes. So um, I think... Uh, that um, even though it's sort of technically finely balanced, I very much doubt whether they will go forward. Gerard, what's your thought? Um, well, I'd like to think they would go ahead, um, whether they go ahead with just the athletes or with any spectators there is a sort of secondary issue. But what one feel, what I feel is that so many governments across the world now are being judged largely on the death issue linked to COVID and therefore uh, that's become so dominant in policy thinking whereas if we actually look at what's happening at the moment because testing is showing more people with this virus in many countries that's making governments fear that there might be the so-called second wave when there are many epidemiologists who suggest that that will not be the case but if you're thinking of a cohort that will be safe, surely it's athletes, they're fit, <laughs> they're quite young um, by and large. Um, but um, I think it would be good if, it w but overall, who knows? Let's wait and see. But it's interesting to hear Narika's comments from a Japanese perspective. But if you think globally, if there is to be a sure sign of things returning to normal next summer, it would be the Olympics taking place and the Olympics taking place without any problems. And in that respect, that would be good, I would argue, indirectly for confidence um, globally. So, yes, um, I'd like to see them go ahead, uh, but I respect other people's views on this. And um, another question, so here from a Japanese question about Mr. Suga. Um, Marlene Robinson asks, will Japanese policy regarding immigration, particularly workforce immigration, change not only under Suga, but if possible to conjecture in the future? Which is to say, do you think that, the, 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 as it were, the Abe policy of this uh, sort of, you know, um, Gastarbeiter style um, immigration is, is, as it were, set for, for, for the medium term or, or is this still under debate? Well, I think that if I, uh, my understanding is correct, Suga was in fact quite, um, quite keen on immigration guest white style. He actually was very much instrumental um, in changing uh, uh, the laws concerning immigration so that we could have more um, uh, uh, workers come into Japan if, under a more flexible regime. Um, so here again, I think uh, in a practical pragmatic way, I think he sees um, a good uh, rationale for opening up Japan more to the rest of the world and its people. But again, I think it's very much in practical terms, um, and I, uh, he is not very much interested in the ideals behind a more open country, I don't think. Uh, but I'm sure he will think of ways of bringing more people in if that seems to him to be, ne uh, to be effective. Um, in uh, uh, getting back growth and uh, creating a larger and stronger economy. Thank you. Now I'm going to finish with a slightly a combination of, of, a, of two questions um, because they nicely round things off. Martin Hatful, Deputy Chair of the Japan Society, has asked, given what we know of both governments' economic policies and the different but related challenges they face, who will turn out to have performed better in, say, two years' time? And I'm going to add to that question, Yumio Yamamoto has asked, will business people in the UK want to travel to Japan or elsewhere, or will you prefer with Zoom? And that, in a way, do you think, does Noriko, which, which country will do best and which country will travel again rather than using Zoom? And I'll ask the same question of Gerard, which is going to, actually, I'll start with Gerard, perhaps, and then finish with Noriko. Gerard, which do you think will turn out to have performed better in two years' time, and who will be traveling more, British or Japanese executives? Um, well, I think, um, well, obviously, who knows who will perform better in two years' time. Um, I think it's important that the UK maybe learn some lessons from Japan about the need to recognise that some of the problems that you face may take considerable time to overcome. So it's about managing expectations. 
also from Japan, it's about learning the need to have unconventional policies and persisting with them if required. But also I think um, even though Abe can be criticized as well as congratulated in some respects as we've heard so far, um, I do think the sort of three arrow approach is a sort of necessary one in the UK, as I touched on earlier, monetary policy, financial policy, fiscal policy, and the whole supply side agenda. So if the UK does actually start to articulate a clear economic vision, then I think it will actually start to do well within the next two years. So in answer to your question, who knows, but let's hope it's both of them time for first spot. Um, in terms of who will travel more, um, after we had the SARS crisis in 2003 or four, I was at Standard Chartered. At that time, people were predicting that things would never return to normal. Now, SARS is nothing like COVID. But what was remarkable, if you look back now, was how quickly things did start to return to normal. So 18 months after it was back to where we were. Now, I'm not suggesting this will be the case now, but we might be pleasantly surprised that things will start to pick up. Although undoubtedly, there will be more of the virtual aspect than the physical traveling as well. But international connectivity, I think, however it takes place, will be important. Thank you. Last word before we close, Norika. Okay, it all very much depends on who is in power uh, within those two years. Uh, if we get a change of government in Japan, um, I think there is hope uh, for a sweeping change in the approach to economic management, management which may uh, improve things. If we don't, I think uh, uh, we are in, in for a very dodgy time. And the same goes for the UK, I think. If, if this present lot stay in power, who knows what will happen. Um, and as for travel, again, I think it's uh, whether we are talking about uh, company executives or just people, I think that makes a difference. The Japanese executives are very, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, very uncourageous people, if you like. Uh, so once now that they have got a feel for not having to travel, uh, but get on with business, I think uh, they will stick to Zoom. Interesting. Well, thank you both very much. That's a very interesting um, finishing point. I thank you both, Gerard Lyons, Noriko Hama, for your um, very clear, very provocative, very, uh, very thought-provoking um, views on these two economies. We will monitor what happens. As, as Gerard said, who knows, because there are so many factors that can affect things, but I think that's given us a great basis for thinking about the autumn and the recovery from uh, COVID. I thank the Japan Society members and others who've joined this call uh, and wish to uh, encourage you to come back again. We're going to have uh, one about the media in our two countries with uh, Aiko Doden of NHK um, and John Simpson of the BBC on, um, on uh, September the 29th, talking about NHK and the BBC and coverage of foreign affairs um, in our uh, media. Um, so I welcome you back for that. But meanwhile, many thanks again to Gerard Lyons and Noriko Hama. Have a great day and a great evening in, in Thank Japan. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.